Hello and welcome to Principles of Accounting 2, Accounting 221, Managerial Accounting. I'm your host, Dr. B. Uh, this is the first day of the spring 2021 semester. I'm happy to have all of you with me today as we explore the first two uh, chapters of our OpenStax uh, textbook resource. We are going to discuss a couple of key elements in the classroom, which is why you're seeing the classroom first. And then we will jump into the content. So as you start out in the class, there are, uh, I want to point out a couple of key areas to you. The first one is, uh, this is your home page. I'll have regular announcements that will be almost daily, every other day. There's usually three, four, five announcements every week. Uh, every announcement that I post is designed to help you. I, I don't like, you know, fluff or anything like that. I, uh, uh, like you as a soldier, I, my intention is to give you the facts, the facts only, and do everything I can to help you out. So uh, the announcements will be important. Uh, the calendar, also extremely important. Uh, as you can see, we, we have a very busy eight weeks ahead of us. Today being the first day, every, every Wednesday from four to five, I will host optional Zoom and office hour where we do a little bit of lecture and, and some discussion. And of course, uh, your assignments are, are due. So for this first week, you have your academic integrity assignment, which is the academic pledge and uh, a few certificates if you haven't done those already. The second one is a report out. Uh, just like you had in Accounting 220, there is a weekly report that helps you, helps us to better understand the resources that are in the classroom and how you're interacting with those, which is the reason why we have those reports. And it's also kind of a reflection for, for you to reflect on the resources and on what you learned. And each week, we also have a homework assignment uh, week one homework assignment is, is up and available. Uh, it, it is in the, I, they call it the Leo quiz. I'm not quite too sure why they call it that, but it, uh, it's not a quiz. It's a homework assignment. Uh, it, there, uh, it's 10 questions in length, uh, multiple choice, true, false. And uh, I believe there's one matching and a few open-ended questions. Uh, the session today will help you to, of course, answer those questions and will also help you with the content that we're covering during the week. In addition to that, there are a couple of discussions. Uh, there's the introduction, scavenger hunt. You'll select a 10K, uh, you'll, a 10K, a, a company. You'll, you'll select a company from the Fortune 500 list. The company must have inventory. Uh, it, can, it can be the same one that you did in 220. That's fine. I have no problem with that as long as the company has uh, inventory. You'll post that request to that discussion form and I'll either approve or deny it based off of the in, uh, information. If I deny it, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why. Uh, but make, please make sure that you get in there and start your discussions. So what do you do? Uh, go up to the content at the very top week one. There's a nice week one overview, what it is that you'll be learning throughout the week. I strongly recommend that you access the uh, Principles of Accounting 1 and 2 uh, volume books. Those are located in the e-readings. You can download them, especially for those of you who like to read offline. You can download the, the uh, textbooks here. You can also uh, view the PowerPoint presentations that we've added, all that good stuff. So please make sure that you do that. I will say this, th the vast majority of the questions that you'll have on homework assignments and the exams are based off of uh, th uh, those books, the volume one and volume two. So as long as you follow the structure in each week, you'll be fine. Uh, within each week, you'll see that we have uh, learning resources. There's required learning resources and supplemental. The required ones, 
yeah, required. So definitely please make sure you read through the, uh, those two chapters each week uh, from, from the book. It will certainly uh, be beneficial for you, especially as you go forward to complete the homework assignment and the exams later on. Uh, the weekly activities. This is where you'll be able to find the discussion forums. Uh, there's a scavenger hunt, just like you've had uh, in previous courses. There is a request for 10K. We have a project in this course that utilizes a 10K resource from your selected company. The company must have inventory, must have inventory. Can't say that enough. And it needs to be from the Fortune 500 uh, list. Academic integrity assignment, it is a pledge. This, this changed from previous semesters. You, you used to have to do a, uh, watch some videos on YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, this is a lot better. It's a lot easier. All you do is go through the academic tutorials if you haven't already. You're, you're more than welcome to submit once from last semester, as long as it was done uh, after August 2, 2020. And then of course, just copy and paste this, uh, this pledge, add your name, and that's it. It's nice and easy. You'll submit that to the assignment folder. Uh, and that's week one. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, week two is very similar in nature. In week two, you'll have your uh, chapter readings uh, and so forth and so on. And we'll talk about that next week. But uh, just, I just want to let you know, every week is structured in the same format. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into chapters one and two. I developed a, pre, a PowerPoint presentation. And we're not going to cover uh, everything in both chapters because there's a lot of information. I am uh, highlighting the important stuff. I, I, tr I Just like I said before, I tried to cut out the fluff, as they say, and, and just kind of really highlight the important things, especially since our sessions are relatively short. Uh, and for those of you on the call, as you have questions, as we as we discuss concepts, please feel free to stop and ask your question. Uh, be, I'll be happy to answer it. Oh, I have a question. Yes, no. Okay, do you post the um, PowerPoint? Is it always gonna yep. be PowerPoint or just for the first day today? Uh, nope. So, so for for each uh, Zoom session that we do, I'll I'll create a PowerPoint and I'll be sure to post it to the classroom. Okay. And my second question is, where do we find it? Where can we find the video like the one you're doing right now? Where yep. So, so I'm going to post that to the discussion area for each week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Okay. So let's start with chapter one. Since this is a managerial accounting course, which is different from 220, uh, we're going to discuss the differences between the two. In, in 220, which was financial accounting, you learned about the financial statements, the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, and the retained earnings. Those are the four primary financial statements that are published by uh, by uh, publicly traded companies. We find that in the 10K documents. That's financial accounting. Financial accounting, the, there's different users, which we'll talk about than there is in managerial accounting. Financial accounting had to do more with uh, those four primary financial statements and getting those out to the general public. Financial accounting is geared for investors to look at the financial statements for the government, for tax reasons, and of course, any other interested party. In managerial accounting, which is what this course focuses on, we look at information for decision makers, the managers of the company. This information, these types of reports are not published. They're not widely available to the public. Why you might ask? Well, as managers, we use internal documentation to better ma effectively manage our companies. And that's what managerial accounting focuses on. We look at accounting information 
for managers to make decisions. We analyze that information and we communicate this information to our employees. That's the primary difference between the two. We'll talk a little bit more about that. What, I, what does management do? What, what are managers? What do they do? Who are managers? Managers are responsible individuals for managing a company. How do they do that? They plan, they control, and they evaluate. They plan, they control, and they evaluate. These are the three primary responsibilities of management. In the planning process, they set goals for the company, what they expect to achieve over time, look at their objectives and targets, and, and they, they plan a path to achieve their goals and targets. That's the planning process. It's very similar to like how you would write a business plan or how, how uh, uh, if you're looking at a map and you have a set of directions, you plan your route. The idea is how do I get from point A to point B? The same concept applies in business. We need to have a plan in place. Otherwise, we're just kind of meandering out there, right? Every business has a, has a plan or at least an idea or a goal. That's why the business is there in the first place. Managers are also involved in controlling. They control the plan. They control how we get to the our end result. It involves monitoring and planning the objectives that we put in place in the planning process. So controlling, making sure that we stay in our lane, right? Managers are also involved in evaluating. Every step of the way, we evaluate the company's performance as we're reaching our goals or as we're getting toward our goals. We do that by analyzing the data, comparing it to actuals to the, uh, the budget or to the expected results. I look at my actual dollar amounts and I compare it to my, uh, uh, my budget. That's how I evaluate it from an accounting perspective. From a business perspective, I look at my goal and I look at my actual performance and I evaluate that performance. Let's talk about the uh, comparison of financial and managerial accounting. There are a lot of different users for the reports. Financial accounting, as I said before, they're focused on external users. Those are stockholders, creditors, uh, government regulators, and the general public. Those are people that are interested in the company's performance uh, for investment reasons or other reasons. In managerial accounting, the managers and the employees are the primary users of those uh, of those accounting statements. The types of reports that are produced in financial accounting, it's the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, uh, and the retained earnings report. Those are the primary ones uh, for financial accounting. Managerial accounting, we're concerned with things like the job cost sheet, cost of goods manufactured, the production cost report, and anything other to do with costing. It's very important that managers understand, control, and evaluate their cost. Frequency of the reports, monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, and annual for financial accounting and managerial accounting, it's as needed. Purpose of the reports, financial accounting, helps external factors make decisions. In managerial accounting, it helps internal users plan and control. Focus the reports for financial accounting, it, it, is a, it adheres to generally accepted accounting principles. In managerial accounting, we're not so much worried about generally accepted accounting principles. We're more concerned about what type of information are we using to make decisions. Nature of the reports are monetary and non-monetary. 
uh, and verification of the reports are audited by the CPA for financial accounting and managerial accounting, there is no independent audit. So the overall point that I'm trying to get across here is that financial accounting, think public, think audited, think it's available to everyone. In managerial accounting, it's you, it's the manager. You're the only one looking at these reports. You and a few people. So there's no need to audit it. It's the reports are, are generated for you to guide the business. Think of it as the internal documents. You don't, you'll never see a cost sheet out on the internet for, uh, for Nike, for example. They're not going to tell you what their costs are. The reason being, they don't want their competitors to know that, right? So there's things to think about. Organizational chart. I'm sure you probably have all seen organizational charts in the past, but this is a very general one. Uh, in most organizations, I say most because obviously not all companies are made the same. And in most large organizations, there is a board of directors. The CEO reports to the board of directors. Uh, the CFO, VP of human resources, VP of manufacturing, VP of sales and marketing all report to the CEO. And underneath there, there might be another line level for managers. And underneath there, there's another line level for managers. <laughs> And then there might be assistant managers, and there, then, of course, there's the employees, the frontline employees for each department. The reason why I'm showing you this chart is I want you to understand a few key concepts when it comes to uh, managerial accounting. Take a look at your rollout here. We have the CFO, human resources, manufacturing, sales, and marketing. <clears throat> Here's the difference. We have what we call uh, horizontal and vertical managers. These, the difference here is that I, I want you to separate the ones that interact with your customers and the ones that are supporting the business. Ones that are supporting the business and the ones that are dealing with the customers. As we can see, the ones that are dealing with the customers, that's the VP sales and marketing line, marketing manager, sales manager, and also the VP of manufacturing because the, the product that the company manufactures interfaces with the, uh, with the customer. Yes, Brittany. Hi, I'm actually, okay, so I'm so sorry. I was, I'm not confused, but I just need clarification for controller and maybe is this interchangeable because at my last company our controller was up there with the cfo um yeah, and she, she was up there in that in that c-suite and shared some of the responsibility because it was two separate people for that privately held and that controller had as much um well you know privy in that um hierarchy so i was just kind of thrown off when i saw controller along that bottom layer as opposed to the top of the org chart, it just threw me off a bit. Yeah, yeah, Brittany, great question. Yeah, so so in some organizations, especially ones that might either be a little bit smaller or have shared responsibilities or shared governance, oftentimes what we'll see is the controller will have the same uh, similar responsibilities as the CFO. Ultimately, the CFO is the one that signs the checks, or it might be the CEO. So so the primary difference between those two roles are going to be those types of responsibilities. But yeah, it's, it is common to, to, for them to have shared responsibilities and, and, and the same, as you said, purview. So, uh, so yeah, so it's very common. And that's a great question. Okay. And we'll talk more about that as, as, as time goes on as well, about the organizational structures. Uh, well, a couple of things I need to point out. You, you probably, hopefully, may have seen this already in, two, in 220. Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. What is it? Why did it come about? Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 was created. Uh, its legislation was, was created because of a series of incidences in the past. 
there was a large company called Enron that committed a very large fraud in the late 90s, early 2000s. What happened with that company is they overstated their sales to make them look really good to investors, but the sales work didn't actually happen, right? So that's illegal, by the way. So uh, this legislation was created to create a sense of transparency for investors. Transparency, honesty, and integrity in reporting of the financial reports. That's why this legislation was created. This legislation also said that for publicly traded companies, their financial statements need to be audited by an independent third party uh, auditing company, primarily the big four accounting firms. And so what that told us, what this legislation informed is that this helped us, helped us investors to achieve trust in, in the companies that we're investing in. And knowing that their financial statements were independently audited, they're honest, transparent, uh, and, um, and, and trustworthy, right? So that's the, that's the idea behind, behind Sarbanes-Oxley. We're not going to go too deep in, in this class on that, but I, I did want to, you to be very well aware of this act. For those of you who are in the accounting program, and if you're planning on taking accounting 320, 320, yeah, 320, uh, which is an ethics course, uh, you will uh, hear about this one again. Professor, I'm gonna ha gonna have to ju jump off. I appreciate the help, but uh, I'll catch the recording. Sounds good, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys Take have care. a good night. Bye. Good night. Okay, it, in managerial accounting, I want you to have the mindset of a manufacturer, the mindset of a manufacturer. In this course, we will focus primarily on the manufacturing businesses, okay? In, two, in 220, you were introduced to service businesses and merchandising businesses. You talked about a little bit about inventory. You talked a little bit about uh, services. 221, we focus a little bit more on the manufacturing businesses. Of course, we'll talk a little bit about the service businesses and the retail businesses, but we do primarily focus on manufacturing. The reason why I want you to have that mindset is because we will be discussing a lot about cost. Uh, the e ERPs are enterprise resource planning systems that help management to achieve their goals by identifying uh, ways that they can automate processes, machinery, lots, uh, identify labor costs, all of those good things. So I just want to let you know what ERP is. Uh, it, it, an enterprise resource system encompasses pretty much everything about a business from a data perspective to help the business to be to run more efficiently. That's pretty much all I'll say about ERPs. Now let's jump into chapter two. Chapter one is relatively easy, in my opinion. It's really discussing and identifying the uh, organizational structures. Chapter two is where it gets fun. <laughs> okay, so as I had just said, uh, there are three types of businesses uh, that we have merchandising businesses, manufacturing businesses, and service businesses. Merchandising is the same as a retailer. I think Macy's, mer merchandiser, a merchandise. The word merchandise is merchandising. Merchandise, that's retail, that's inventory, okay? Merchandise businesses carry inventory. Manufacturing. A manufacturer is a company who manufactures the product, manufactures the goods. Okay. Uh, when we talk about manufacturers, I want you to think about uh, a furniture manufacturer. Furniture. Uh, in manufacturing, there's a lot of different steps. They take the raw materials. In, in a manufacturer uh, for a furniture company, they'll have 
raw materials of wood, uh, metal brackets, fabric, and staining. Uh, well, yeah, we'll just call it wood, fabric, and brackets. Those are the raw materials for a furniture company. And what they do with that raw materials is they process it. And in the processing of raw materials, they'll cut the wood, they'll glue it, they'll, assemble, they'll go through the assembly process and the upholstery process. That's We call that work in process, work in process. So you have your raw materials, you have work in process, meaning we're in the process of creating the furniture or the product. And then we have finished goods. Finished goods are the completed units that we plan to sell. And we'll talk more about that uh, later in this chapter. That's manufacturing. They, they put together the parts that you and I buy, or the, the uh, finished products that you and I buy. And then we have uh, service companies. These are your doctors, lawyers, accountants, uh, consultants. Those are service companies. They provide a service. They don't sell a tangible product, but they provide a service. So that, therefore they don't have any physical inventory. So, the, so again, the primary difference between these three is inventory and processing. Inventory is going to be found in merch, merchandising companies and manufacturing companies. They will not be in service companies. You will also find costs of goods sold. You'll find costs of goods sold in merchandising companies and, manu, and you'll find costs of goods manufactured in manufacturing companies. We'll talk more about that. So going back to my, uh, an example, this is a company that manufactures guitars. We have a guitar uh, uh, seller, a uh, store that's, that placed an order with us. So that's the first step, okay? We received an order from the customer. We, uh, then we'll purchase some raw materials, some wood, guitar strings, guitar bridge. We purchase our raw materials. Then we need to process our raw materials to build a guitar. So this is, this is raw materials inventory. We take it out of raw materials inventory and put it into work and process inventory. And then work in process, we're cutting the wood, assembling the guitar, you know, uh, attaching the strings and the brackets and all that awesome stuff to create a guitar. And then once that process is done, we take it out of work in process inventory and put it into finished goods inventory. This is just a nice graphical representation of that process. Any questions so far? Are we okay? I'm gonna jump into the fun stuff, the costing. Okay. Okay. So as I said before, for this course, I want you to have the mindset of a manufacturer, a manufacturing business. You're taking raw materials, you're turning it in, uh, into a finished product through a, a process, right? As you understand, there is cost associated with everything in business. There is a cost of obtaining the raw materials. There's a co additional cost when we process it. And then of course, there's an additional cost when we put it in the finished goods, right? So a cost is the cost of doing business. In managerial accounting, we look at costs very closely for us as managers to make decisions. 
So costs are often cl classified by their relationship to a segment of operations. We call these a cost object. Think of it this way. Uh, every activity that the business is engaged in has a cost associated with it. So as managers, what we do is we classify those costs based on the activity or, or based on the relationship to that activity. Uh, cost can be classified based off of a product, sales territory, a department, activity, or research like research development or another activity like assembly. Uh, in this course, we'll, we'll focus on costs associated with products, activities, and departments. Okay, we talked about how costs are classified. Let's talk about what types of costs we have. We have a direct costs and indirect costs. A direct cost can be directly traced to that cost object. What does that mean? Direct costs can be traced to the finished good. In my example, we have, we're making guitars, right? The wood used in the guitar is a direct cost. The brackets and the string is also a direct cost. We call that, we call those direct materials, direct materials. Direct costs com, are, consist of direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Direct materials are the materials used in the manufacturing process to create a finished good. They consist of the majority of the cost of that finished good. Direct labor are the individual employees that work directly in the process of creating that finished good. An example of direct labor would be the people working on the assembly line. Okay, that's direct labor. I can directly trace the amount of hours that they worked to a group of finished goods. That's why it's direct labor. And factory overhead. Factory overhead is what we call a mixed cost. There's some direct and some indirect. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. But factory overhead, I can directly trace the machines. I can directly trace the amount of electricity flowing to those machines. But there's some things I cannot directly trace. But factory overhead can be treated as direct and indirect costs. But direct labor, direct materials, those are definitely direct costs. Factory overhead, we call that a mixed cost. And we'll talk about that here shortly. Indirect costs are costs that I cannot directly trace to the finished good. Okay, I cannot directly trace it. For example, think of a manufacturing setting. You have an assembly line. You have your raw materials over here on the left. In the middle, you have your work in process. That's your assembly line. Those are the people making the guitars, yeah? And at the end of the line, you have where your finished goods are being stored. Think of it like an assembly line, right? On that assembly line, you have a supervisor. The supervisor is not physically touching these guitars, okay? The supervisor is responsible for overseeing the operation. They're not physically touching the guitar. So therefore, their, the supervisor's salary is an indirect cost. 
I cannot directly trace that salary to the production of the guitar. The same could be said with utilities. I can't directly trace all the utilities to the manufacturing of the guitars because the lights for, for the factory, it's for the whole factory. It's not just for the, those guitars. Uh, office salaries, I can't trace those. So typically those types of things are allocated in factory overhead, factory overhead, which is why fact, factory overhead is both direct and indirect. We'll talk a little bit more about factory overhead here in a bit. So again, direct costs, those are costs I can, I can directly attribute to a finished good. Raw materials, uh, 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 direct materials and direct labor I can directly trace to a finished good, a guitar. Indirect production supervisor oversees the entire operation. Therefore, I cannot directly tie his whole salary to the manufacturing of a guitar. He's not directly involved in the process. It's indirect. So therefore, I can classify his salary as an indirect cost. Classifying indirect and, uh, I'm sorry, direct and indirect costs come from the idea that of how traceable the expense is or the, the cost is to that uh, product, right? If I can easily trace it to that product, then it's a direct cost. If it's not easily traceable, then it's indirect. Especially when it comes to factory overhead. That's more of a mixed cost than anything else. Let's talk a little bit more about it. Cost of manufacturing includes the materials used and the labor used in the production of a finished good. We have these things called conversion costs, conversion costs. A conversion cost, think of it this, uh, a conversion cost this way. A conversion cost is a cost that is being converted, right? The word conversion. I'm converting raw materials into a finished good. I'm converting those costs. We'll talk more about that. For a finished product, there are three costs involved. There are direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Those are the, th I'm gonna keep saying those things. And you're gonna, at the end of the semester, you're gonna be like, oh, I remember direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. <laughs> but these are the costs associated with manufacturing. And since it's a managerial accounting class, we're focused on controlling and planning cost. Which is why we talk about it. So direct materials to direct labor, factory overhead, all go into the pro into creating a finished good. Let's break it down even further. Direct materials. Direct materials are the larger part of a finished product, and they contribute to a significant portion of the total cost of that product. So in our earlier example, in the production of a guitar, the wood the the brackets and the string those three things make up the most cost of making that guitar when it comes to materials that is other examples would be uh if if you were to create a television you're you know you're making a television the electronic compo components make up the most cost of a television uh, for for uh, microchips, um, a wafer, which is like a very small increment disks that make up a microchip in a computer, that makes up the most cost of a microchip. Uh, tires for an automobile is a large cost of, of, of a vehicle. Well, not really, but you get the idea. <laughs> Okay, so that's direct cost. D 
direct labor. Direct labor involves the people that directly are building the finished good. Direct labor. If it makes up the most um, uh, cost of manufacturing the product, we can allocate it to direct labor. In our earlier example of the guitar assembly, the wages of the employees that are cutting the wood and assembling the guitar, that's direct labor because they're directly involved in the manufacturing process. Other examples would be a mechanic for an automobile, a machine operator in a man that, that are making tools. Assem uh, assembly workers that are assembling laptop computers. Or just think of it this way. They're directly touching the product. Direct, that's direct labor. The people that are actually touching the product and actually doing the work, that's direct labor. Best way to think about it. Okay, here's the more complex part. Factory overhead. Oh, factory overhead. <laughs> so costs that are other than direct materials and direct labor incurred in the manufacturing process are combined and classified as factory overhead. Sometimes we call this manufacturing overhead. Factory overhead, these are interchangeable words, right? By now you've learned in accounting, some words mean the same thing. <laughs> we just call it differently because that's how it works in the English language. Factory overhead, uh, is base, is the group of everything else that are involved in the manufacturing process. But it's not direct. It's not direct labor, not factory overhead. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not direct labor and it's not direct materials. It must be factory overhead. Factory overhead involves the building. It involves uh, the lights for the building repairs and maintenance, property tax, depreciation, heating and lighting, you know, utilities. An assembly line is typically located in a factory. The factory itself has, ex has cost associated with it. We cannot directly associate the whole cost of the factory to the manufacturing of a product like a guitar. So that, that's why we call it factory overhead. It's overhead, right? And so because we can't directly allocate it, we do it indirectly through factory overhead. And what we'll, what we'll discuss is there's different methods of allocating factory overhead to the cost of the finished good. But before we show you the how that works, I want to talk to you about uh, those costs that we just discussed. Okay, direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead can be grouped together for analysis and reporting reasons. Two areas where we allocate these. We call them prime costs and conversion costs. Prime costs. Prime costs include direct materials and direct labor. They're prime. They're prime. Primary. The word primary. Primary, prime, prime cost. All, they all mean that they make up the, they're the primary cost of that finished good. That's why the, where the word prime cost comes from. Conversion costs. We are converting raw materials into work in process to finish good. We are converting electricity into the uh, machinery to drill the holes for the guitar conversion, right? Conversion costs typically consist of direct labor and factory overhead. You're, you're probably saying, Dr. B, you just said direct labor is a part of a prime cost. Yeah, it is. It's also a conversion cost. What do we mean? We convert these costs into the finished product. If an employee has an hourly wage 
and they are able to produce 10, out, 10 guitars in an hour. I'll take their hourly wage, divide that by 10, and that would be the uh, direct labor cost for each guitar that was produced during that one hour. Does that make sense? Wait, wait, hold on, Dr. B. I, okay, hold on now. Okay. All right, I was doing good. Um, I get how it's constituted as a primary cause, but I'm trying to make sure that I understand in my mind how it constitutes in the conversion. Is it because it's factored in to the totality? Like why? What's the reasoning behind that? Sure, good question. So it's a primary cost because as, as you said, they, uh, it's primary, they work, it's a prime cost. They yeah, work I get directly that. on the product. You got that part. Mm -hmm. The conversion part, it's a conversion cost as well because their entire wage can be converted into the total cost of the finished product. Oh, okay, I get it. Okay. Got it? So, yeah, so, yeah, it makes more sense. Cool, very good. So for example, if an employee made $10 per hour and they were able to produce 10 guitars in one hour, I would attribute $1 of direct labor to each guitar. Yeah, conversion cost. Very good. Good question. Thank you. So direct labor is both a prime cost and a conversion cost for that reason. So here's a nice graphical representation of that. Direct materials, direct labor are both prime costs. Direct labor and factory overhead are a conversion costs. So for factory overhead, you might be asking Dr. B, how do I allocate factory overhead to uh, finish good? Well, it works like this. You take your total factory overhead cost and divide that by the number of units produced. And you're able to attribute uh, a portion of the factory overhead cost to each finished good. We'll talk more about that as, as time goes on. Okay, more classification. Oh, I know, I know, I hear you. <laughs> more classification. <clears throat> All of these great costs that we talked about can be further classified. Direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead which are the three primary costs that, that make the finished good cost are a part of what we call product costs. Direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead make up the total cost of the product. Therefore, we call it product costs. Then of course, we have other costs that are associated with the selling of a finished good. We call these period costs. Period costs include selling, ex selling and administrative expenses, selling and administrative expenses. Oftentimes companies will have this on the same line item. This is just broken out just to kind of show you what each one is. Selling expenses are incurred for marketing and the delivery of the product to the customer. Administrative expenses include the management of the company that are related to the manufacturing or selling functions. That could be like the, uh, the plant manager's salary or the sales manager's salary or both. They're, re they're related to the selling of the product, but it's indirect. So selling administrative expenses are classified as period costs. You may have heard the term period cost in 220. Period cost means it's incurred during that period, during that period, but it's only for the costs that are related to the selling of a finished good. Question for you then. Yeah, Brittany. All right, I got. I, I need you to specify because there's. This seems like there's a subtle nuance here that I think I'm missing. So you're saying because you the in the example you just gave, mm -hmm. you said like, the if it relates to the sales, like the sales manager, but wouldn't that 
could that not debatably be an indirect cost as well? Because in the other one, you said like the production supervisor salary. So would that also be able to fall under the administrative expenses for period costs? It would, yep. And, and okay. the period costs are recognized in factory overhead. Yep, good question. Absolutely. We're good. Are we good? We can go forward. Let's break it down a little bit further. A couple of examples for you. Product manufacturing costs include direct materials. In our example of manufacturing a guitar, we got wood, string. Well, yeah, I guess string. It could also be, well, yeah, it, wood, string, and the facets. Direct labor. The people sawing the guitar wood the people gluing it together, the people assembling it, those are the assembly workers, is direct labor. Factory overhead. Uh, if it's a smaller cost of the, of the total guitar, it could be guitar strings, I guess. Wages for the janitors, the power to run machines, depreciation expense for the building, sandpaper and buffing materials, oil for the machines, Salary of production supervisors, well, it's factory overhead. It's indirect, right? I can't directly tie those things to each unit. So therefore we classify it as factory overhead. Ultimately it gets applied to a unit from a group of factory overhead costs. So when you think about factory overhead, think about all the stuff that we can't directly tie to the assembly process, but we know they're involved. Then period costs, these are non-manufacturing costs. These are selling and administrative expenses, advertising expense, sales salaries, commissions, administrative office salaries, office supplies expense, depreciation expense. There's, of course, there's more than that, but those, that's just kind of from our example, yeah. Uh, period costs, period, product, I'm sorry, product costs, period costs, uh, so again, product costs tied uh, are that, that's your direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. They are incurred on the balance sheet. You find these on the balance sheet. Uh, you'll find it in inventory. Uh, so in inventory, there's a couple of line items in inventory. You'll have raw materials inventory work in process inventory and finished goods inventory. The, uh, the, these are subsidiary accounts that belong to the inventory account on the balance sheet. When we sell a guitar or a finished good, we call these cost of goods manufactured Cost of goods manufactured, sold, I guess, if you will. You can find the cost of goods manufactured, sold, on the income statement, on the income statement. It, remember from 220, well, hopefully you remember. On the income statement, you have your revenue, that's your sales, minus your cost of goods sold, or in this case, cost of goods manufactured, equals your gross profit minus your expenses equals net income, right? And then on your balance sheet, you have assets equals liabilities plus equity. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. That's on your balance sheet, as you remember. And as you know, inventory is an asset account because we can convert it to cash, right? Yay. So just keep those fundamentals in, in, uh, in your mind as you, work, as you work forward. The period costs are reported as expenses on the income statement. Remember, the period costs are selling and administrative expenses in which they are incurred and thus they do not appear on the balance sheet. 
Selling, selling and administrative expenses, they're expenses. They're not going to show up on the balance sheet. They're going to show up on the income statement as an expense. Okay. This, again, nice visual representation of what we just talked about. Product costs uh, will show up on, uh, on the income, on the balance sheet as inventory and as cost of goods sold on the income statement when we sell our inventory. Period costs are on the income statement only as selling and administrative expenses. Okay, the financial statements for a manufacturing business are going to be different, slightly different from those of a service or retail business. Service businesses, they don't have cost of goods sold because <laughs> they're not selling anything. A service business, again, that's your doctor, lawyer, accountant, uh, consultant, they're service businesses. They're not selling a product. Therefore, there's not going to be a cost of goods sold on the income statement. But of course, there will be fees earned for revenue, and then you'll have your various expenses. For a retail business, you're going to have your, rev, your, your revenue, which are often called sales, you'll have your cost of goods sold. Because remember, retail businesses, all they're doing is they're buying it from a distributor or from a manufacturer and then selling it. And then you'll have your expenses. In a manufacturing business, you'll have revenue or sales cost of goods manufactured, sold. And then, and then you'll have your selling administrative expenses in, in the expense line. And then you'll eventually you'll work your way down to net, uh, your net profit, just like you normally would. On the balance sheet, uh, the manu uh, the, on the balance sheet, it's a little bit more complex because uh, in the inventory, on, on assets, you're going to find your, um, it, for inventory, you're going to find raw materials, work in process, and finished goods inventory. I'll show you, I'll show you here in a little bit what all that looks like. On the balance sheet, your materials inventory, that's your raw materials. Work in process. Think, remember, keep in, keep in mind the flow of an assembly line. You got your raw materials over here on the left. In the middle, you have your work in process. That's the actual assembly line where they're in process of cutting the wood, gluing it together, putting together the guitar, right? That's work in process. A normal day runs from what, eight to five, right? So eight in the morning to five o'clock at night. At five o'clock at night, when everyone's when you hear the whistle bell go and everyone goes home for the day, what do you think? It's all going to be finished goods? No, <laughs> there's going to be stuff left in in process. So that's why there's there's a work in process inventory. That's why that exists. Then we have finished goods inventory. Those are goods that are completed and they're ready to be sold, but have not yet been sold. So raw materials, work in process, finished goods, these are all inventories on the, under current assets on the balance sheet. So here's how it looks. Uh, your company, here are the two companies. Music Land is the store that I sell my guitars to. My company is Legend Guitars, where the, we are the manufacturer. So as the manufacturer, you see that we have direct materials, work in process, finished goods. You add those three together to get your total inventory. We sell our, uh, our finished goods as they're finished. We, we try to sell them as quickly as possible. That's the idea of business, right? Uh, to our customers. One of our customers is Music Land Stores. And so you can see the dip primary difference between the two types of businesses. Music Land Stores is a retailer. They're a merchandising business, which is why you see inventory and it's just inventory, right? And then Legend Guitars, we are a manufacturer and we have 
uh, th the three items for inventory, direct materials, which is also known as uh, raw materials, work in process and finished goods. These are all inventories. Add those three together to get your total inventory. So this is a nice visual representation of the difference. What about the income statements? The income statements are slightly different between a retailer and a manufacturer, primarily because of the cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is for merchandising. Cost of goods manufactured is for a manufacturer. Uh, the income statement for retail business on the left side of your screen, sales, uh, and then of course you have your beginning inventory plus purchases equals inventory for sale minus ending inventory uh, equals cost of goods sold. Sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. That's what you learned traditionally in 220. To, uh, but now of course we're introducing a new thing, manufacturing business. And manufacturing, we have beginnings, beginning finished goods inventory plus cost of goods manufactured uh, to get us to our cost of goods available for sale minus our ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. Sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. Once you get these uh, uh, simple formulas down, you'll be fine. And also the book does a pretty good job of, of highlighting those formulas, in my opinion. Okay, uh, so again, the primary difference here between a retailer and a manufacturer is cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold for a retailer, cost of goods manufactured for manufacturing business. Now here's an uh, interesting thing. <clears throat> Since we're talking about managerial accounting, we have reports that we generate just for management to focus on running the business. So because of that, we, we create a report called the Statement of Cost of Goods Manufactured. And this statement is a summary of the cost of goods manufactured during the accounting period. Just as you learned before, the accounting period could be a, it could be a month, it could be a quarter, semi-annual, or annual. And here's what that report looks like. It shows us the beginning work and process inventory. And then we get into direct materials, uh, beginning materials inventory. That's, get, remember, your raw materials, right? Plus any purchases equals cost of good materials available for use. Available for use. Word available for use means it's ready. It's in my uh, raw materials inventory. And I can take it out of there and start using it start using it in the assembly process. That's what it means available for use. Minus ending materials inventory equals the cost of direct materials used. Direct materials used or raw materials used. Plus direct labor plus factory overhead equals the total manufacturing costs incurred for the period. You take your beginning work and process inventory uh, minus your total manufacturing costs, or I'm sorry, beginning work in process inventory plus your total manufacturing costs incurred for the period equals your total manufacturing costs plus ending work in process inventory equals cost of goods sold. Yay. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a lot of detail, but th this is the primary structure of, uh, of a, um, statement of cost of goods manufactured. <clears throat> okay, uh, also what you'll see commonly is the report might look like this. You can see we have January 1 and December 31. The January 1, those are of course your beginning balances, your beginning balances. December 31, those are your ending balances. And from, of course, from your beginning to your ending balances, we can identify the amount that was used for the accounting period. Uh, 
we're almost done. I'm, so, I'm sorry we're going a little bit, little bit over time, but uh, we're almost done. And, and if you have to drop off, I understand, but I, I just want to let you know that we're, we're almost complete. The statement of the cost of goods manufactured is prepared in three steps. Number one, we determine the cost of materials used, cost of materials used. This includes, okay, this includes the purchase price for the raw materials, purchase price for the raw materials. And that's for the cost of materials used, okay? So we, it's your, your beginning balance, uh, plus any purchases, minus any inventory, cost materials used. Then we have the second step is to determine the total manufacturing costs incurred. Now remember, in the manufacturing process, we have direct materials and direct labor. Direct materials and direct labor. And of course, well, factory overhead. And then once we figured out the direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead that was used, we can then determine, step three, the cost of goods manufactured. Just a nice little visual representation of that process. So earlier we talked about cost of goods. I want uh, this slide is a nice visual representation of the difference for cost of goods sold. The, this shows us a nice difference between a merchandising and a manufacturing business. You have your beginning inventory plus cost of goods manufactured for manufacturing business minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. For a merchandising business like Macy's or whoever, and in, in our example, it's the it's the company that sells guitars. We're the one that makes it. We're we're the guitar legends. That's the manufacturer. The the other company, ABC Merchandising, they could be selling our guitars. To figure out their cost of goods sold, what they do is they take beginning inventory plus cost of goods goods purchased minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. So again, the primary difference between a manufacturer and a merchandising business is we have cost of goods manufactured for manufacturing and cost of goods purchased for a merchandising business. Okay. So in, uh, in manufacturing, in uh, managerial accounting, we use a lot of internal reports to better manage our business. Some of these internal reports include the schedule of the cost of goods manufactured and the schedule of materials used. This is very simple to understand. It is a breakdown of the changes of inventory levels and the transfer of that inventory from one inventory to another. So we, we typically start with the schedule of materials used. You have your beginning materials inventory plus materials purchased equals materials available for use minus ending materials inventory equals direct materials used in production. The direct materials used in production shows on the schedule of cost of goods manufactured as direct materials used. Under the cost of goods manufactured, we start with the work in process uh, beginning inventory plus cost of manufacturing, I'm sorry, current manufacturing costs, which include Direct materials used plus direct labor plus manufacturing overhead. Remember, material, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. Those are the three primary costs associated with manufacturing. These equal the, so beginning uh, 
work in process inventory plus current manufacturing costs equal total current manufacturing costs uh, minus work in process ending inventory equals cost of goods manufactured. Okay, so breaking it down a little bit further for the manufacturer on the income statement, we have revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus operating expenses equals operating profit. Uh, yeah, that's the very basic, right? Uh, very, very basic form. But within that cost of goods sold, that's where it gets a little bit more complex for a manufacturer. Within cost of goods sold, we have the beginning finished goods inventory plus the cost of goods manufactured equals finished goods available for sale minus ending finished goods inventory equals cost of goods sold. Sorry, there should be a Y at the end of inventory. <laughs> I must have been typing a little fast. Okay. With, uh, within the schedule of cost of goods manufactured, which we talked about in the last slide, to get to cost of goods manufactured, we take work in process beginning inventory plus current manufacturing costs, which include direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead equals the total current manufacturing costs minus work in process ending inventory equals cost of goods manufactured. Your book the, probably illustrates it a little bit best. It's a little bit, you know, uh, what do you call, jumbled on the slide. Schedule of materials used. Uh, your raw materials, beginning inventory plus purchases equals materials available for use minus ending materials inventory equals direct materials used in production. But you see how it all ties in. Here's a nice visual representation of what you would see on an income statement for our manufacturer. This is a visual representation of the cost of goods manufactured statement that we just talked about over the past few slides. I like this visual representation. Now this shows the relationship between the balance sheet and income statement as it relates to manufacturing costs. As we said, we have direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. These are the three primary costs associated with producing a product. These are used in the manufacturing process. Any unused uh, raw materials goes from direct materials to your balance sheet of, of materials inventory or raw materials inventory. What's used goes into the manufacturing process. And of course, direct labor and factory overhead are part of that manufacturing process. There's no inventory for labor or, or overhead, right? So direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead in the manufacturing process. Anything that's any work that is unfinished, we call that work in process. Work that is unfinished is work in process. And work that's finished it is the finished goods inventory. That's when we finish the assembly of, of our product. We put it in the finished goods inventory. And eventually it gets sold. When we sell it, it, it translates onto the income statement as cost of goods sold. I think it's almost the last slide. I think it is the last slide. Uh, this just kind of shows us the difference between a manufacturing and a service business Service businesses, they don't have any inventory. Uh, service businesses only use period costs. Manufacturing, they use both period and product costs. It's a nice visual representation of the difference. So just keep in mind, ser service businesses, there's no inventory involved, there's no manufacturing involved. It's relatively simple. Uh, the overhead stated is an indirect cost because it serves customers. Whereas in manufacturing, uh, we have manufacturing overhead and it's an indirect cost in the manufacturing process. And those are really the primary differences. 
Uh, schedule of materials used, we talked about this. Uh, you have your beginning balance of raw materials plus purchases equals materials available for use. Mining minus your ending inventory equals direct materials used in production. Uh, I believe we talked a little bit about this in accounting 220. Just in case we haven't, I, I want to uh, point this out, the difference between fixed cost and variable cost. Fixed costs are, thing, are costs that remain the same regardless of production, regardless of production. In other words, the factory still has rent. The factory still has a mortgage. That doesn't change. If I'm not making guitars, I still have rent, right? So that's a fixed cost. Uh, salary, uh, office salaries, that could be a fixed cost. Um, fixed costs are difficult to alter in, in the short run. Examples of fixed costs are rent, insurance, and salaries. We also have variable costs. Variable costs are costs that change based off of production volumes. These will be hourly wages of employees on the assembly line the amount of electricity that's used in the building and the materials used in pr the production process. These costs will change based off of the level of output. One more level unit of output will have a higher cost associated with that. Uh, two quick formulas for you to uh, know. One is the first one is average fixed costs. We take our total fixed costs divided by the number of units produced. Average fixed costs. To get that, we take the total fixed costs divided by the number of units produced. The nice thing with accounting that you'll find with, when it comes to these types of formulas, anytime it says the word average, it's usually always divided by the number of units produced. <laughs> Uh, average variable cost, you take your total variable cost divided by the number of units produced. And the last cost, mixed cost. Mixed cost, and we talked about the, a little bit about this in factory overhead. Mixed costs are costs that contain both fixed and variable components. They can be uh, altered slightly, but they're difficult to trace directly, which is why they're mixed costs. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways to do that. But the good news is we don't go too deep in that class on, on mixed costs. <laughs> so that's probably, that'll be safe for your cost accounting class. <laughs> and that leads us to the end of our session. I apologize that we went a, a few minutes over, uh, especially for these first sessions. Usually it goes a little bit longer because of introductions and all that good stuff. And of course the housekeeping things. But uh, that is at the end of our product, our, our uh, presentation for chapters one and two. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns that you might have uh, for chapters one and two at this time? You all still awake? Uh, <laughs> Brittany, Ryan, Nell, Justice? You're all okay? You can still hear me, right? I'm still here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. One question for you, though. Yeah, go ahead, Brittany. I, I, I just wanted you to repeat it again to make sure I got it nailed in my brain, because it's been a while since I've discussed this stuff. You said there's one thing that will, did you say it would never appear on the balance sheet? You said it in the beginning of the, of the discussion, and oh, you yeah. said it would only appear. What was that? And can you just explain that one more time? Yeah, so, so you, you, you will never find uh, selling an administrative expenses on a balance sheet. Yes, okay. Yep, because those are expenses. And expenses are found where, Brittany? Ugh. Which financial statement are expenses found on? Come on, you know this. They're period expenses, and they would be found on which financial statement? Would it be A, the income statement? B, balance sheet. C, statement of cash flows. I wanted to say balance, income but I don't remember. I don't remember. This is bad. Statement. Now, income statement, 
That is correct. It will be found on the income statement. Ah, okay. Remember, the income statement includes revenue, revenue, expenses, expenses, that income. I don't even remember this. I'm it's telling okay. you, it's been over a decade since I've taken an accounting class. That's bad for business. I'm gonna get it though. I'm good. That's why I had to ask. I was like, wait, hold on. Will. Yeah, all right. You, you get it. Yeah, Brittany, just go uh, and 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 as a refresher, you might want to just kind of uh, gloss through that uh, financial accounting book that's also in the classroom. I'm going to. Yeah, I it'll help for sure. As a refresher. Like, Definitely. It's been like seven years. Like, yeah. It's kinda... <laughs> I got you. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, the income statement has revenue, expenses, net income. Uh, well, revenue, cost of goods right. sold, expenses, net income. The balance sheet. Yeah, I'm going to review assets, all that. liabilities, and equity. Statement of cash flows. Oh, my God. Operating yes. activities, investing activities, financing activities. Okay, yeah, I'm going to review all that stuff when we get off of that. It's okay. been a while. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thank no you. No worries. Okay, so are, th are there any other comments, questions, or concerns for these first two chapters? Sure. So you said the direct labor costs translate directly to the balance sheet, but indirect labor costs go to the income statement? No, la labor costs never show up on the balance sheet because uh, lab labor is classified it, uh, typically as an expense, but it, it so uh, you might be confusing it with, with materials. Materials you'll find on the balance sheet under inventory. You'll, you'll, you have raw materials, work in process and, and finished goods. Labor, uh, is a, a primary cost associated in the manufacturing process. It it in it will indirectly show up on the balance sheet as a, a cost of inventory, but you'll never actually see labor on a on a balance sheet. Does it, it'll never be listed as labor? Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Good question. Any other questions? We okay? Okay. Uh, and as always, if you ever have a question, you know, a question about the homework, a question about anything, really, just just go, please reach out to me. Uh, you have my cell phone number and you have my email address. My cell phone number is right here in the overview. And there's my email address. Uh, both of those things go right to my phone. So, uh, you know, if I'm awake, I'll probably respond. <laughs> I'm pretty quick, yeah? Uh, so please reach out to me. Anytime that you need help, I'm here for you. Um, let's see. Uh, so, so for this week, just as a reminder, participate in all of the discussions, the introduction, the scavenger hunt, request your 10K for the 10K project, academic integrity assignment, um, all of that good stuff, right? And then you'll also have your homework assignment, which is 10 questions, multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank. Uh, and that you'll also have your week one report. It's not that long. It's like, what, a paragraph or two? Nice and easy. It's more like a reflection on, on your, um, your thoughts of the uh, materials, that type of stuff. And uh, as always, the, if you have uh, questions, I'm sorry, go ahead now. All of them, are they due tonight? No, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I would never do that to you. Today's the first day. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all due by, by Tuesday night, Tuesday night. And that's the, that's the end of our week, right? Uh, for UMGC, the start of our week is on Wednesday and it ends on Tuesday. So, so next Tuesday night is, is when uh, all of this should be due. Okay. All right. Okay. But, but definitely work early. You know, I, I recommend that everyone works ahead of time if you can, because it's really important that you don't fall behind because as you see, there's a lot of work in this course, you know, each week you got a whole bunch of stuff to do. So if you want to work ahead, please feel free to do so. But thank you. Okay. Yeah, great question. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, I would love to call it a, a day. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for you. Thank you, everyone, so much for your time. I appreciate you. Stay safe. Be well. Wash your hands. All of that good stuff. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. I appreciate you. Have a great night. Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye.
Thanks, Thank you.